Well, welcome. This is the second class of the Gospel Teaching Series for the Love of God. My name is James Trevett of Whitestone Christian Ministries, and I'm here to share with you class two, which is the original sin. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the purpose of creation. In the purpose of creation, we studied last time that God is looking for someone to spend his eternal life with. Someone in his own image, that he created us, that he may have a bride to have and to hold, to love and to cherish for eternity. And the story of God and the story of us is a story moving toward this, this destiny that we have together. So as we went through the scripture, we understood that God created man and woman for the purpose that he may teach us to understand relationship. And that he, of course, is the male and we're the female in the marriage. We're to be his bride. So the relationships that we go through and all the things that's happening down here on the earth are very important because at some point, I believe 6,000 years after Adam and Eve, he's going to choose a bride. Someone that will be by his side for eternity. So that's what we covered in the last class. And we ended with the, this scripture in Revelation. It says, to him who overcomes, I give the right to sit with me on my throne. So who is it that sits on the throne with the king? He who overcomes. He who overcomes. But that's the bride, isn't it? Isn't the bride the one who shares the throne with the king? So who's going to be the bride? Well, the scripture indicates it's he who overcomes. Now, this was from the letter written to the church of Laodicea. And even though the, the letter was written to the church of Laodicea, it doesn't say to the church that overcomes. It says to the individual. That it's an individual choice. But the real question that we have here is what? What's important to know here? What, what do we need to overcome? And hence, this is our second class called the original sin. And the discussion we're going to have is what concerns would God have about taking a bride to be married to for eternity? I want you to think about that. Now, when we get married down here, we get married for 30, 40, 50 years. But he's going to get married for eternity. Now, outside of salvation, very possibly the choice of your mate may be one of the most important choices, if not the most important choice you make. So what's important to understand when you're making that choice? That's the question. Most of you all are married or have certainly been in significant relationships in the past. So what did you use for criteria of who to select? Is it important? Does it matter at all who you choose? I think most of us found out that it does matter. Maybe some of us found out the hard way. But it does matter. So how did you find out who you were going to choose? Maybe your parents gave you advice, but where do you think they got that advice? Their parents. Their parents? <laughs> it probably went on, but somewhere in the midst of all this was some experience, wouldn't you say? It's probably not. Uh, I'm sure that everybody reads a book on how to choose the perfect mate, right? No, I think a lot of it has to do with the experience that you have in your life or your parents have had in their life that a lot of the understanding about relationships comes out of experience. And this experience will be very important in our relationship with Christ. So how are we going to understand what's important to God? Well, what I'm going to do today is I, I want you to bear with me as we look in the scripture about God's history in relationships. Now, do we know God's history back to eternity past? No. But what we do know is the Bible. He gave us his word. And in that word, I believe, are significant information that we can look at to understand. It's what he's chosen to show us. And so therefore, let us go back and look in the Bible about some of the past relationship issues that he may have had and what concerns he may have. Our key scripture for the original sin is in the pride of your heart you say I am a God Ezekiel 28 2b so let's look a little bit at 
what I'm calling the original sin. Now, the original sin had an original sinner. There was an original sin. And it took place someplace. It's sort of like uh, when you're playing the game of Clue, you know, Colonel Mustard in the, you know, in, in the dining room with the candlestick. But, but something happened here. And we want to look at the original sin because maybe as we look at these things, it gives us a clue to what's important to God. So let's look at the original sin. Now put on the screen the definition of original sin. It says, in Christian theology, the condition of sin that marks all humans as a result of Adam's first act of disobedience. The Catholic Encyclopedia takes this and extends the fact that the sin that Adam committed, but a consequence of the first sin. So the original sin we're talking about is the original sin of man. But the question is, is it purely disobedience was the issue? And the reason I'm addressing that is, I know the Pharisees also thought that it was originally disobedience. Now, the Pharisees believed that when God showed up on earth, that he was going to congratulate them because they were more obedient than the other people. Is that how it turned out? So maybe we've missed something. So let's look to get a deeper understanding of this original sin. So to do this, I want to go back a little further. Now look at this character, Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low the nations, or troubled the congregation is another interpretation of that word. So who do you think we're talking about here? Lucifer. Lucifer. So this was Lucifer, I believe very much prior to the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And notice he's called the morning star. Where do you think he got that name? Well, Lucifer means morning star or he who brings light, light bearer. So originally, Lucifer apparently was something other than the evil Satan that we know him as. But notice what it says. It said, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. So, was there a law? Do you think God gave him a rule and said, Thou shalt not ascend to heaven. Thou shalt not raise your throne above mine. Because it doesn't even say that he did it here. What it says was, you said in your heart. So could it be that there's an issue of the heart here that may even go beyond the actual statement of disobedience? So what do you think was in Lucifer's heart here? Can you see that his heart was lifted up and rather than submitting and loving God, he said, no, I want to be my own God. As a matter of fact, I want to challenge you and exalt myself. Any thoughts? We good? Let's continue on a little bit. So to understand a little bit more about this, I want to go to Ezekiel 28. So I'm going to Ezekiel 28, 1 and 2. We're here, the discussion is coming on a character called the ruler of Tyre. He said, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say to the ruler of Tyre, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Now Tyre, I've got a little picture here showing Tyre and Sidon, was the center of the Phoenician Empire, which moved around in the Mediterranean during this time. And was an empire for a long period of time, actually. And this is the ruler of Tyre we're talking to. But let's see what he said. He's God said, and God obviously had an issue with this man, in the pride of your heart you say, I am a God. Now where do you think he got that idea? You notice where the pride was? In your heart. So can you see an effect here in the heart? In the pride of your heart you say, I am a God. That's our key scripture for this teaching. I sit on the throne of a God. Does that sound familiar? I'll raise my throne. I will sit enthroned. Okay. 
in the hearts of the seas, but you are a man and not a God, though you think you're as wise as a God. So this is a man, but can you see the influence? And obviously this is important to God because he brought forth this word through Ezekiel about this man. Let's look a little bit more about this man. Who was this man? Well, the man was actually Ethbaal II. He was the ruler of Tyre and Sidon during this time of Ezekiel. His predecessor was Ethbaal I, 280 years earlier, and it was a long dynasty. And if you look, most of those guys all used Baal in their name. Because Ethbaal I was actually a priest of Baal, and through treachery and murder and a few other things, got the empire. His name means with Baal or possessed by Baal, Eth Baal. So is this a clue also of what this is about? Mm-hmm. Baal, by the way, means master, owner, lord, husband, or God. So who do you think Baal is an, is an interpretation of? Can you see it's trying to make himself as the image of God? Mm-hmm. Where would he get that idea? We covered that, right? I will ascend to heaven. I'll raise my throne. I will sit in throne on the Mount of Assembly. I will make myself like the Most High. Can you see that here in Baal? So Baal is an anti-type for God. An anti-type from the standpoint of he's against God, but he's also trying to imitate God because he wants to be God. So looking at F. Baal, Two, let's go back to his predecessor, Ethbaal I. He's also mentioned in the Bible. He's mentioned in 1 Kings 16, 30-33. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, making golden calves to worship, but he also married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the... Sidonians. This is Tyre and Sidon. So as you see, Ethbaal I also had the same issues as Ethbaal II. Interestingly enough, his daughter was Jezebel. Yes, the daughter of the devil, roughly, if you want to say that. And this was Ahab, who was what? Well, he might have married. He was also the king. He was the king of Israel. So what has happened here? The people called by his name Israel have joined themselves to the daughter of the devil. You see an issue here. Do you see why God may have been slightly upset? Was it just disobedience? Did he give a law and say, Thou shalt not marry the daughter of the devil? Or is there a deeper meaning here? Was God upset? Was he hurt by this situation? Ahab (coughs) began to set up altars and worship Baal. And it says that he did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. And there were some kings before him that weren't all that great. But you can see that it, it provoked him to an anger. Something here was very emotional that happened. So it wasn't just plain disobedience. You screwed up. This is something much, much deeper. Let's go on in Ezekiel 28, just a few more verses later, and we'll see another character here. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre. Well, remember who the other guy was? He was the ruler of Tyre. Well, the king is a higher level, so if he was the ruler of Tyre, who is this? Let's look and see. This is what the sovereign Lord says. You are the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone adorned you. So as we stop right there, who is this? Satan. At this point, the image I'm showing is Lucifer. But can you see this? Now, if I read this description, what does that sound like to you? Well, let's just say if you're a man and... And you're out there saying, describing this as the model of perfection, full of wisdom and beauty. 
Every precious stone adorned you, so you've got all this bling and jewels. I'm going to go out and say it sounds almost like there's a relationship here, that this is the way that a man would describe the love of his life. A beautiful creation, full of wisdom and beauty. Ladies, do you understand that this is how we see you? That's how love works. This relationship is clearly shown to me in these words. Now this is who he was, but let's go on and read on. It says, every precious stone adorned, adorned you. And we go through the stones, and it says, your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. Now your settings and mountings made of gold has other interpretations. Those words actually are timbrel or tambourine and pipes. So in many translations, that's talked about musical instruments, not just relating to these stones. That I don't know, but it's very possible that Lucifer was there to worship God. After all, they hung out in the Garden of Eden together. Does this sound like a relationship to you? But what happened? What happened? And when we understand this, could it help us understand? Because people have said, well, why didn't God just create us perfect and take us to heaven right off? What if in a way he actually tried that? What if he made an image of this? Remember, this is what he chose to share with us in the word. Let's continue on. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God, and you walked among the fiery stones. Now, we could make a case as to whether this Garden of Eden, or Eden, the Garden of God, that's here, was the one on the earth, or whether there was one in heaven where he spent time with Lucifer. I don't know. The fiery stones, I don't remember fiery stones and the one on earth. But in either case, wherever it was, that's where he used to walk and spend time with Lucifer. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till what? Wickedness. Wickedness was found in you. Maybe it goes beyond disobedience here. Maybe there's a deeper meaning. Through your widespread trade, if you look that up, it talks about immoral transactions. Widespread trade, you can imagine what that might mean. You were filled with violence or rebellion, and you did what? Sinned. Sinned. So there was a sin that occurred before the Garden of Eden. Now, it's not the sin of man at this point. It's the sin of Lucifer. But if we can understand this sin, we may be able to understand the heart of God and what he is concerned about. Let's read on. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, O guardian cherub. So what do you think? Uh, do you see emotion in what God did here? You see an anger and a frustration for what happened. The betrayal that came from the pride and arrogance. As a matter of fact, he just says that. Your heart became proud. Where? Your heart. Sound familiar? On account of your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to earth and I made a spectacle of you before kings or royalty, whatever that may be. So can you imagine God's heart here? What, what can you see? What can you think about here that may have happened? Can you see that God was hurt? Can you see that he did create Lucifer? Beautiful, full of wisdom and beauty in a great relationship. But something happened. This pride entered in, this arrogance, the betrayal came, and ultimately, the widespread trade. So what do we consider that God is concerned about in the relationship? That now maybe he's decided, well, I'm going to try again. Now maybe God laid all this out ahead of time. But he tried again, and he created the earth, he created the Garden of Eden on earth. And in the Garden of Eden, he began to walk with somebody else. Who was that? Adam. Adam. So what do you think God might be concerned about that might happen here? Can you see an understanding now of God's heart? Can you see what he's concerned about? Is it just disobedience? Let me give you an example. Um, let's just say a man got married, and he says, okay, 
Uh, I'm marrying you, but I'm going to give you two rules. The first thing is, you will buy no shoes without getting my approval first. And the second of all is, you will not commit adultery with my best friend. Okay, here's, here's the two rules I've given you. Now, she goes out and, okay, she slips up and she buys some shoes. What would you call that? That's disobedience, wouldn't you say? But on the other hand, if she slips up and commits adultery with his best friend, is the issue you're going to talk about just disobedience? Is that the real issue you want to discuss here? <laughs> I gave you two rules and, and you know, you messed up this rule. Well, 50%, that's not bad. But you see the issue. It's not just an issue of disobedience. There's something much deeper here than disobedience that we're talking about. And I think that's what God feels. We don't know all the things that cause him to hurt like this. But we do know there's an example given us in the Bible about what Lucifer did. So as we continue on, let's look back at Isaiah. It says, Oh, you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne. I will sit enthroned. Can you see the pride of his heart and his arrogance? Because of all this beauty, he's decided, I don't need you, God. I'm going to be my own God. Can you see how that hurt God? Can you see the betrayal? And how that could happen in a relationship? And maybe you've been through something very similar to this. And you understand the hurt of it. It's more than just disobedience. There's something much deeper here. What is it? What does the man care about? Jesus said it. He said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So is an issue something greater than, than just disobedience? There's the question of faith. Now, if you meet a woman and you decide you want to marry this woman, what is one of your big concerns? Will she be what? Faithful. Isn't that interesting? The, the term faith and faithful. Will she be faithful? faithful? Will she be full of faith? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And by the way, will he? Yes. Where? Here? And here? And here. He will find faith on the earth. Let's look at another example of Lucifer and how he might have affected this world. Genesis 11. It's the 11th chapter in the Bible. And this is the Tower of Babel in Babylon. And it starts out by saying, Now the whole world had one language and common speech. Now understand, this is uh, Nimrod, who is a close descendant, I think, of Noah. And this is after God had rescued these few people from the flood. You're thinking, well, obviously now, what they want to do is they want to build a huge monument and church and a place to worship God, right? Was well, that what they chose to do? No. It says, they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. So where do you think these people got this idea? Any thoughts? Does this sound familiar? How about... I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I'll make myself like the Most High. So what was this tower all about? Them. They thought it was about them. They said, here's what we're going to do. We've come together. We can do just anything. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a great name for ourselves. We're going to rule and reign over this world. We're going to... We're going to clothe the poor, we're going to feed the hungry, we're going to give health care for everybody, we're going to take care of everybody. That was their plan, right? But there was another plan underneath here. What do you think would have happened when they got the tower built? Lucifer's already said. He said, I will step in and I will make it my throne. He's talked man into building his own throne. Now, at the time, God said, well, I'm going to go down and confuse their language, didn't he? 
So he kept this from happening. But I believe that if they would have built that, that the devil would have stepped in on top to rule and reign on the earth. Now, why do I think that? Well, first of all, let's look at the Tower of Babel. Notice this is the same scripture in 11.4. Did you notice that right after this, in Genesis 12, God went out and found a man called Abraham. Abram, here. I will make you a great nation. I will make your name great. As opposed to, we will be a great nation, and we will make our name great. So, what man was trying to do, God says, no, I think I'll pick my own, thank you. And so he chose somebody. Did he choose Nimrod, who was already out there building this thing? Why didn't he just pick him? If he wanted to have his name great, then he could put his name right on this thing. Is that the way God works? Is that the way it worked with Saul and David? Is that the way it worked? You remember Saul? He was the tall one, the, the one they thought was great. So God says, no, that's not what I'm looking for. What do you think God was looking for? Someone after his own, what? Heart. As a matter of fact, you know, when uh, Samuel went to choose the king, being led by the Spirit, he, he goes over and he says, Jesse, you got some sons here. You're the man, so we want to see your sons. One of them will be the king. So he brings out this son. You remember what uh, Samuel said? Surely, this is the man who's to be king. And then he asked God, nope, that's not him. So bring another son. He said, he went to his sons and said, you have sons? I mean, what happened here? It was the one that Jesse himself had hidden away, who apparently did not have the respect of the other sons. That was the one he chose. See, God has a way of doing these things his own way. So as we look forward on the Tower of Babel, we'll notice that there's a principle here that continues to follow through the Bible. You remember one of my principle one was, I make known the end from the beginning. That's what we covered in class one. It began with the marriage of Adam and Eve, and it ends with the marriage of Jesus to his bride. I believe the Bible continually shows what's going to happen in the future because God says, I will declare it from the beginning, so when it happens, you'll know it was me. So this is a picture of the Tower of Babel. I think it was created in the 1500s here. And the image I'm showing beside of you is this poster that was created uh, when they put together the European Union. And whether you can see it or not, their uh, slogan here is Europe, many tongues, one voice. And you notice they used this very image in their poster, and they put these 12 stars, which I believe comes out of uh, Revelations 11, is it? But notice one other thing. What, you see, I don't know if you can see that or not. Can you see that thing right there? That's a crane. <laughs> so what are they saying? <laughs> We're back to building the tower. Do you understand that now... The world is coming together. See, back then, it was the languages that were confused. He confused the languages and stopped the tower from being built the first time. But now, with the internet and all things, what's happening? Is the language separating us? So we're going to come together, and we're going to solve all the world's problems, and we're going to honor God, right? No, because God declares the end from the beginning. What did they do the last time they all spoke the same language? They started to build a tower, but what's the difference? The difference is this time, they are going to build the whole thing. How do I know? Because it's prophesied that once they get it built, the devil does step in on top of it and claim to be in charge and possessed the Antichrist and rule and reign. So can you see the, what's happening here? It's all based upon what Lucifer was saying. I will, I will. See, Lucifer is a great I will, but what's God? I am. Lucifer is very performance based. God's very identity based. I am. He doesn't have to do anything. And by the way, if you're wondering how the European Union went forward, they actually ended up building the Parliament building in Strasbourg in the exact image of the picture of the Tower of Babel unfinished and left it this way 
And they did it on purpose, folks. This, they literally state that that was what they were modeling. So why? Because this is a model of the world government in the last days. Isn't God amazing? Yeah. I was also amazed as I looked at some of this. In Revelation, it talks about Babylon. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. For all of the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. Now, does it say the, that all the nations have committed disobedience? You see a little stronger word here? Adulteries. Adultery. Why? What is the adultery? Who have, who have these people been listening to? Another who claims to be God, Lucifer. It's an adultery. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. So are you beginning to see that maybe it's more than just disobedience? Maybe there's an actual adultery involved here? Mm -hmm. Maybe that when Eve listened to Lucifer instead of God and obeyed him rather than God, maybe she was drawn away by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life by the pride, and that she turned on Adam, and then the, together they turned on God. See, Lucifer got a twofer there. He got the woman to disobey the man. That's why he would, of course, tempt the woman, because of the type. If I can get woman to rebel against man, and then mankind to rebel against God, I get a twofer. Mm -hmm. And we'll cover that later on. Interestingly enough, as we looked at Isaiah 14, it says, Lucifer said, I will ascend to heaven, I will ascend above the top of the clouds. We looked at Babylon in Genesis 11, and it says, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Interestingly enough, God, through his word, said this. His judgment and prophecy of the last days of Babylon in Jeremiah, it says, Her judgments reach to the heaven and towers up to the very skies. In Revelation, it says, Her sins are piled up to heaven. God has such a way with words, doesn't he? Mm. Yep, you made it. You made it. You built a tower. And yes, you did make it into the heavens. But it was your sins and your judgment that reach it. Not your self-righteousness. So you see a picture here. I want to share a scripture now in Luke because understand a lot of people thought it was just pure disobedience and I'm sure the Pharisees thought that. That's why they worked so hard on obedience. They really thought that when Jesus showed up that God comes down on earth he's going to compliment them because they were good people. They were doing great things out there. They're like the Pope. They were more righteous than anyone. And they were certainly more obedient than anyone to the law. So naturally you would think that when Jesus showed up, he would congratulate them, right? And then the sinners who were not obedient, he would judge them, right? Because if it was just obedience, then that should be the measure. That's what would happen. Is that what happened? Let's look at what happened. The words of Jesus in Luke 18, 9 through 14. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, which seems to come together. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector here. I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I possess. Obedient, huh? But where's the issue? The heart. Let's read on. And the tax collector standing far off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me a sinner. So was the tax collector a sinner? Yeah, he was. It wasn't just he's being humble. I mean he was probably a a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Justified. Justified. Right? Standing before God. Justified. Before God. 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. There's something here greater than just disobedience. Do you see it? Yeah. Do you see the issue that, that destroys your relationships? Do you think it's when you screwed up? Is that what do you think messed up your relationship? Do you think it's that you made a mistake? Or that you were prideful and arrogant? What do you think it is that destroys relationships? Let's think about that because anybody can make a mistake. But what about your arrogance and your pride and your self-righteousness? Could it be that that may be a bigger issue here? So where were the Pharisees in this? He made it pretty clear. They, ex they were exalting themselves. It says right here, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. God didn't like that. He says, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I think James said it very well. But he gives us more grace, which we need. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what is it here? Is it just doing the right thing? What's the Bible about? Right and wrong, good and bad? Is that the choice that we have? Could it be that there's something deeper in this choice? When you look at it from a relationship standpoint, you may see something a little different about what's important to God. Maybe the fact that you screwed up wasn't quite as important as you thought. What's important are the issues of what? The heart. God looks on the heart. If a man's going to marry someone, what's he looking at? You look at your, your mate, what do you want? It's an issue of the heart. This is a relationship. I included Hebrews 1.3 because people may have thought, well, God was one way, and then Jesus comes down and he says, you know, I'm looking at things differently. So therefore, the Pharisees were upset because Jesus is the nice guy. God is this upset guy up there. He's always angry. But Jesus came down because he's the nice guy. But Hebrews 1.3 says this. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. When Jesus was on the earth, what did he do? What he saw the father. the father doing. Now, why would he have done that? Because he wanted to be a slave? No, he did it because he wanted the world to know who the Father was. I think Philip had it right when he said, show us the Father and it'll be enough. Jesus showed us the Father. So it's not just Jesus is some nice guy and God was the upset one. This is God all along. Unfortunately, the Pharisees missed it. Unfortunately, a lot of us miss it too. So when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's the question. Not will he find robots able to do exactly what he says. If that's what you're looking for in a wife, I think you may have missed something too. That's not what you're looking for. You're looking for someone who you can love and will love you. And love is an issue of the heart. And love is also what? A choice. Does, the law cannot make you love anyone. So what concerns would God have about taking a bride who he'll be married to for eternity? Will she be faithful? It's an issue of the heart. It's not just an issue of obedience. Where did the original sin take place? What was the original sin? And who was the original sinner? Depends on how you want to look at it. The original sin of man definitely took place in the Garden of Eden. But when we understand the sin that may have occurred in Lucifer, maybe we can take another dimension to that. Maybe it wasn't just a question of pure disobedience. Like, don't, don't eat that thing that I left in the refrigerator. 
Maybe there's more to it. Remember, God did not say, if you eat of that tree, I shall surely kill you. He said, if you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. There's a reason. So why do you think God would put Lucifer on the earth with man? Any clues now? Why do you think so? To see if we'd be faithful. That's right. Because he wanted to make sure and give us a choice to do what he wanted us to do, love him, or he gave a clear picture of who? The sins of Lucifer. That's a tough thing. That you had a relationship that broke up and you've got that person coming down into your relationship as a test. But imagine if a man's saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to get married soon and I know these hundred women. So what are you going to do with these hundred women between now and when you pick your bride? You're just going to give them everything. We tried that. That's what Lucifer had. It wouldn't work. No, actually, you're going to create a test. In your own mind, you want to say, who is it? Which one? That's what God's doing down here. That's why all this is here. That's why Lucifer was in the Garden of Eden. Do you see now? Does it make sense to you? Mm. So I'm, once again, I invite you to take this to God. The Holy Spirit is here to interpret his word. He's here to show us Jesus. And through Jesus that we may know the Father. So I encourage you to take this to him and see what you think. Maybe some of the things that you're learning down here on this earth through these relationships may have more value than you think. There may be more things that are important to God than you may have thought in the past. Maybe you looked at it the wrong way. Maybe you would have been a Pharisee and thought to himself, you know, I, I do so much better than the other guy. I must be okay. After all, God grades on the curve, right? No. No. But there is a way. It's about the relationship. Soon, very, very soon, Jesus is coming back and choosing his bride. Who's it going to be? I don't know. I do know one thing. It's going to be he who overcomes, and that is not going to be everybody. Everybody on the face of the earth is not going to be the bride of Christ. I can't tell you who's going to be, but I can tell you that I want to understand. I want to understand what he wants in the relationship, and I want to understand the humility that it takes to get the grace of God. Any questions? Well, our next class is called The Two Trees. Why would God put two trees in the garden on the earth? Why would he do that, you think? Any clues? Any guesses? <laughs> choice. Choice. <laughs> So, gee, I've got to give them a choice. So we're going to look at the significance of the two trees next time. And the choice, uh, of course, we think it's about good and bad and right and wrong, right? Hopefully by now, you're beginning to see things a little differently. That maybe it's not just about, if I do all the right things, God's going to love me. Maybe there's more to this than that. Maybe there's more to this choice than we think. If you do good then you'll be great. If you do bad, then you're going to hell. I'll just give you a spoiler. Everybody that does good things is not going to go to heaven. I know. It's a hard thing. You know, we talked about the um, Babylon. You know, that was a pretty significant thing. Do you know how significant it is? That if you take the mark of Babylon, I don't care how many good things that you've done in your life. I don't care how wonderful you are. What do you think is going to happen to you? That's it. The mark is important. So hopefully we've learned something today about Lucifer. You know, there's a song back in the old days. I'm old enough to remember this called Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. You remember that? So what do you think the uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds stood for in the song? LSD. But do you have a new understanding of who Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds was? Lucifer, adorned with jewels in the Garden of Eden. Any questions? Thank you. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this word of truth. And I, 
I ask you to touch each one and open their hearts, Lord, to what's important. What's important, Lord? What is it that's in our heart that we need to deal with, that, that concerns you, Lord? So we want to deal with the issues of the heart because we know that that's where you look, Lord, and there's where the love is. So thank you for your word and I ask you to touch each one with a revelation of this, that they may deal with the issues of the heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you all.